welcome. And thank you for joining today's Native American Heritage Month presentation. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the WebEx participant and chat panel by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. Please note, all audio connections are currently muted and this conference is being recorded. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the webinar, which will be addressed throughout the webinar. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and send. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I will turn the webinar over to Dr. Ian Thompson. Dr. Thompson, please go ahead. Hello. Oklahoma Hello, everyone. I greet you in the beautiful Choctaw language. My name is Ian Thompson. I'm Choctaw and Euro American. I was born in Independence, Missouri, and now I reside with my wife, Amy, near Antlers, Oklahoma. And I serve as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Today, I'm going to be giving a presentation on Choctaw traditional food. The Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Our homeland is in the southeastern United States. It incorporates part of the Mobile District Army Corps of Engineers jurisdictional area. However, we were the first tribe in the southeast to walk on the Trail of Tears to what's now Oklahoma. Today, we're the third largest tribe in the country with about 200,000 200, tribal citizens. And we have a strong relationship with the Mobile District Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, our office consults with you guys on a weekly if not daily basis about the projects that you do down there. And we've built several different partnerships that I think have been positive both for your institution and, and ours. The presentation that I'm giving today is a fun one. Uh, it's about a deep traditional culture, lots of different visuals that I'd like to share with you. And we'll go through it. It'll last about an hour or so. In our community, we, we face a, a number of health challenges that are related to food. You know, we have incidents of diabetes, obesity, stroke, cancer, high blood pressure that are much higher than national averages. Part of the reason for this is because most of the top nation is in a food desert. Our ancestors didn't have these same health problems, and their diet was considerably different than ours. So what I'm presenting today is research that has been done um, by myself and my wife and, and our community to look at what our foods were like originally back before colonization. So to get started with that, I'm going to return to talk about oral history. Our community holds a lot of our history and oral traditions that have been passed down from one generation to the next. And many of these emphasize our connection with the Choctaw homeland present day, East Central Mississippi, West Central Alabama, and then on south to the Gulf Coast from that area. One of our oldest stories talks about how Choctaw people were created from the yellow clay that you see in this picture here on the banks of Nanawaya Creek in Kemper County, Mississippi. From the very beginning, we still emphasize our connection with our homeland, with the earth, with the fertility of the earth, and with the creative power of God, and also with the plants and animals that you find in that area. And of course, all of these things are the basis for our food way and ultimately our culture. We have a unique experience that goes back in our homeland that, that no other group of people shares for that particular piece of the, of the globe. We have oral stories that talk about the creation of the Tom Bigby River Valley. These stories talk about animals that lived there in giant packs. These animals were of huge stature. And they tore down the trees as they browsed them. Um, killing the trees created what's now known as the Black, black Belt Ferry. For quite some time, archaeologists felt that our ancestors had not lived within the United States for a particularly long period of time. However, in the 1920s, archaeology realized that our ancestors did, in fact, live side-by-side -side giant animals in our homeland, like the woolly mammoth and the 
passed on. And not only that, but our ancestors hunted them. These animals went extinct about 12,000 years ago, so that puts our presence in the Choctaw homeland back at least 600 generations or 12,000 plus years. When our ancestors hunted these animals, this was long before the bow and arrow. What they used was the atlatl pictured here. The atlatl is a stick with a spur on it that's held in the hand, and that fits into a concavity in the base of the dart, and the dart's almost like a giant arrow. With just that simple mechanism there, a stick, a deer antler, a piece of cane, some feathers, our ancestors created a weapon that has better penetrating power than a 30 6 rifle. This weapon is quite effective in taking down elephants, as our ancestors used to do. To me, this highlights just the, the simple ingenuity that being deeply aware of the homeland and being connected with it for generations brought forward. And you can say the same thing for any other group of people around the world, but of course today I'm, I'm focusing on the Choctaw people and the Choctaw homeland. Our ancestors for hundreds of generations obtained all the food that they needed just from the plants and animals that were located in the environment around them. But it, they certainly managed these. It wasn't an untouched wilderness by any stretch of the imagination. But just from the productivity of the land combined with management, they were able to get all the food that they needed. On the left is a, a series of projectile point styles that our ancestors made um, after the end of the last ice age. Most of you guys know that the large animals went extinct and the plant communities changed within the southeast become a little bit more like what they are today. So our ancestors adapted, and you can see that in the series of projectile points here. They ultimately adapted them for hunting deer instead of woolly mammoths or giant bison. On the right-hand side is an example of one of the types of interesting foods that they came to rely on to quite an extent, especially in the Pine Hills region. This is contact. Um In English, it's called sawbriar root. Our ancestors would dig those out of the ground. They look almost like baby aliens. And then they would peel them, and they would heat them in an earth oven. That's what you see pictured at the lower right there. That's a, an earth oven from the Choctaw wood set. The stones in the bottom of it were used as heating elements to make the temperature consistent. With this type of apparatus, they would cook these roots for 24 hours to make them palatable. Modern experiments with this type of cooking feature have shown that it is just as reliable as a modern oven, and it requires just as little maintenance or, or looking at it to ensure that the temperature is right once you know what you're doing. Through time, our, our society continues to develop generation from generation about new things. Um, our ancestors, in part, visit what today recognizes as the Poverty Point World Heritage Site. This is located in eastern Louisiana. The picture that you see at the left there um, is a very far away picture of a giant earth man. And that earth mound took, I believe, something on the order of 10,000 dump truck loads of soil to create the equivalent of that. But, of course, our ancestors created it by carrying basket loads of soil. And they were layered in certain ways to prevent it from eroding. You can't tell it from the ground, but if you were to fly up above that, that earth mound is made in the shape of a giant bird flying away from the, the nearby wetland feature that's located in that area. Archaeology has shown that our ancestors built that mound within about a 30-day period. Again, they were just using hand tools, and no dump trucks or anything. That speaks to the organizational level that they were able to achieve at this community, and it's particularly impressive because they did not have agriculture. They were able to do this just solely based on obtaining food from the primary productive productivity of the land and the water nearby. This was about 3,500 years ago. Through time, things continue to change. Our communities um, started to work with plants that were domesticated. Domestication is known to have happened in some different places around the world independently. One of those is just north of the Choctaw homeland. As I talked about, our ancestors were able to build huge settlements and earth mounds without the benefit of agriculture. But about 2,500 years ago, we did begin to, to plant agricultural crops. At the right-hand side there, that's a picture of land scorter seeds. Land scorter is a native plant. It's called Canusia in the Choctaw language. Uh, it makes an incredibly nutritious green, and it also has a seed crop that's very similar to quinoa. So if you went around the eastern or midwestern United States 2,000 years ago, instead of seeing fields of corn, you would have seen fields of this plant. Our community has stories about the advent of corn agriculture. 
One of those stories talks about corn coming from present-day southern Mexico. That story was recorded 100 years before archaeology confirmed that corn was, in fact, first domesticated in southern Mexico. When our communities began to cultivate corn, it changed our settlement pattern. Um, we spread out to different areas to take best advantage of the soils that would be most fertile for corn agriculture. Um, this led to our settlements being dispersed in a series of farming hamlets in different areas. You can see some of the, the beautiful pieces of artwork that our community made at this time that we transitioned to corn agriculture. And a lot of it, like the two shell gourd jets at the top, refer back to the sign and the sacred fire, which is ultimately connected with the productivity of agricultural crops and corn agriculture. As I said, through this whole vast time period, uh, our ancestors did not live in an untouched wilderness. They managed it. Fire was their main tool. Archaeology tells us that the use of fire to manage the landscape goes back at least 10,000 years in our homeland, if not more, and that the use of that management technique intensified through time. So over that length of time, our ancestors actually helped to shape what is considered the natural environment and natural ecosystems of the Choctaw homeland. You know, in other words, you can't separate those from our own culture. If you want to talk about indigenous Choctaw food in any detail, obviously it has this long period of development, so you have to focus in on a specific time period. And what I did for my work is to focus in on the time period of the early 1700s, because that's when our diet was still fully indigenous before being significantly impacted by colonization. But it was recent enough in time that there are many connections with the landscape, with language, with modern Choctaw culture. The image that you see here is the Choctaw homeland. And if it's big enough on your screen, you can see the Choctaw names for all of these different ecozones and places that are significant. The ecozones are colored in different ways. So we've got the, the long leaf pine forest there in dark green at the bottom. We've got mixed forest in the light green. The tall grass prairies are in the light brown, and the river valleys are in the sort of pink color. Each of these had importance to Choctaw culture, and particularly in providing ingredients for our traditional food. This is how the forest looked in our homeland when they're managed regularly by fire. Um, some entities are, are working to do that again in our homeland. The fire opens up the brush. It kills some of the parasitic insects like ticks. The timing of the fire also helps determine whether the understory is dominated by grasses or forbs, as in this case. Prairies exist naturally in our homeland. I was telling you about the story of the Pleistocene megafauna creating the black belt prairie. Our ancestors worked to expand this place because they had so many resources through the use of fire. A number of streams go through Choctaw country. One of the top words for stream is Pochinna, and that means water road. That pays homage to the fact that these were major sources of transportation for people and other types of goods and food products in the past. Additionally, some of these have important resources for Choctaw food preparation implements. This particular picture, you can see the sort of purplish clay in the foreground at the right. That clay is some of the, the best clay for making traditional cooking pots. It makes pots that happen to be really resilient. They, they really resist cracking when you're using them. So our ancestors built a major site there, um, Moundville. They, it's recognized as one of the largest Settlements before European contact in the United States, actually, it was about half as big as contemporary London. And part of the reason that it was built there was because of this particular clay source. Heading farther south, we go to the Longleaf Pine Forest. The Longleaf Pine Forest is basically tall grass prairie with longleaf pine trees growing in it. It's also a fire community. This type of ecozone, the understory there, has the second highest ecological diversity outside of the tropics. So it's just tremendous resources there. Farther south still, we come to El Capo Chico, the Gulf of Mexico. And there are studies that have shown that up to one million pounds of fish per square mile um, out of these waters, one of the most productive environments in North America. So for 600 generations, our ancestors carefully adapted their society and their traditional culture to living with these different types of landscapes that I've just spoken about. Europeans first came into Choctaw country in the early 1500s under a, a Spanish system. Um, they sought to, sought to set up what's known as the Encanamita. This was intended to set up Spanish 
nobility over different conquered native villages so that they could receive the fruits of the labor of the native people. Repeatedly, native people in the southeast were able to fight off Spanish groups that came through until the first wave of European diseases hit. And those were catastrophic for native communities because native people had never been exposed to those diseases before, so they didn't have very much immunity. Disease after disease is talked about in the historic records that came through and killed half the people in one community or another. So within time, approximately 90% of the Native American population in the Southeast died as a result of European diseases that ultimately made it possible for colonization to take place, first with the Spanish and then the French, then the English and then the United States. Through this process, the Choctaw land base was reduced by 99.84%. And with that happening, with control being removed, Choctaw control being removed from the management of the lands, an ecological disaster occurred. So here you see also just one small example of what happened. Here you see also in a long leaf pine forest. This is before Choctaw removal. You can see those old growth trees, possibly 300 years old. They're up to 100 feet to the first branch. Just pretty amazing ecosystem. This is what happened to that ecosystem. This is an image from the 1920s of it being clear cut. This is what was left. Of course, with the trees gone, then you had massive soil erosion. So the landscape was permanently changed. Under a lack of management, this is what eventually happened. Um, this is a, a forest that was destroyed, regrew, and invasive species came into the area and just completely choked it. But because of what you see in the picture here. When I was a kid, I used to go to landscapes like this in our homeland, and I would think, man, I don't think these must have been tough people to live in a place like that. But of course, the reality is they didn't live in a place like that. They lived in a place like this, and it's just been changed over time. But fortunately, it, it is possible to change it back to a certain extent. The loss of knowledge is significant. In terms of our food way, the loss of knowledge and the loss of connection with the land has lowered the quality of our diet, it's made it less diverse, it's made it so there are less fresh foods, and it's replaced these things with more calories, salt, simple carbs, and saturated fat. You can see the image there at the right that's numerous, that's a, a Mississippi-style effigy bottle, a type that our ancestors made a thousand years ago. It's round, it's designed to carry liquid, but also that's the waste, unfortunately, the shape of the waistline that a lot of our community has as a result of a low-quality diet. Traditional culture is not only something that can be destroyed, it can also be rebuilt, recreated, revitalized. And there are lots of sources of information about our food way as it was before your human contact that are scattered through all different sources. No one source can completely provide all of the information to revitalize our food way. But if you bring all of these small scattered pieces together and organize them in the right way, the thought and the research I was doing is that maybe we could reconstruct a lot of our traditional food ways that was in 1700. So, you know, we've gone out and talked with elders about what they remember about the food way, looking at oral histories in a lot more detail than I have in this presentation. The Choctaw language is a descriptive language, so oftentimes it records information about our food and our relationship with the land and ways that aren't recorded elsewhere. Archaeology provides very really specific insights into how things were done at a certain time and place by our ancestors. Ethnology. Um, early anthropologists went out and talked to Choctaw people who lived an indigenous life. And although it was recorded through the lens of ethnology and anthropology, they recorded some really valuable information. Historical documents. This is one of my favorite pictures here. This is a recipe written down from the mouth of a Choctaw woman in the 1880s. Obviously, it's in the Choctaw language. And she described how to take the roots that I showed you earlier, the, the saba roots, the concop, and to make those into a dumpling through a, a fairly complex process that's not recorded anywhere except in this handwritten document here in the Choctaw language. You can have all this information, but it's only of so much value unless you experiment with it yourself. You actually figure out how these things work. So the research that I'm going to present is based on 10 years of experimental work not just making these seeds, but making the seed preparation implements, the baskets, the pottery, revitalizing the seeds, tracking down the top top here, the seeds and growing those, and learning how to do it, managing patches of curry, woods. It's all a really integrated type of research that ultimately has brought back a lot of information about our traditional seed way. 
some of the things that you have to have to produce a traditional foodway, of course, is a healthy piece of land. In the traditional Choctaw way of thinking, fire is the most important, not only the most important cooking tool, but it's also got a tremendous amount of spiritual significance. It's seen as being an earthly connection with God. One of the traditional Choctaw names for fire is Loa Kashtali, it's a Choctaw, and that means fire, the partner of God. Other important items, and this is kind of going in the order of um, processing materials from, from raw ingredients to finished food. This is Kishi, the Choctaw pack basket, made out of river cane. From my understanding, river cane basketry goes back at least 2,000 years in our homeland, probably something more like 6,000 years. It was connected with uh, the creation of swamps in our homeland that happened as a result of the glaciers up north melting after the ice age and the hypothermal, the warmest part of our current geologic period. This is the mortar and pestle. Kitty and Kitapi in the Choctaw language. This is used for grinding up food products, uh, almost like you would a, a blender, but it also has the use of a, a mixer. So this is really important in the foods I'm going to tell you about. On the left is a woman using it. On the right is the process for making one. Um, you pack the end of a log, the right kind of log, in wet clay, leave an opening at the center, and then you put a hot coal on it. And through a piece of river cane, you blow on that hot coal, and eventually it burns away the wood underneath to make the depression to hold the food. This is an image of a really complex and yet beautifully simple system that Choctaw folks and other Southeasterners developed for processing raw dried corn into cornmeal and corn flour. You grind the corn in the mortar and pestle, like you see in this picture. You take that corn and put it in a sifter basket made of river cane, which the lady is holding here on the left. Large pieces fall through. Those are collected underneath. In the process, um, you take a fanner basket when the kernels are partially pounded, and you put them in the fanner basket, and you toss them up in the air. And the corn kernels are covered in a chaff, and that chaff will blow away in the air, leaving just a meal, which you then return to the mortar and pestle and grind again. So it's, it accomplishes a really complicated task, separating the husks from the corn and grinding it up, but with just a few simple implements too. Cooking pots, there are oral histories that talk about how chop pot people first learned to make pottery. According to that oral history, a gentleman had a, a river thing basket and he wanted to use that to hold liquid. So it seemed to him like it'd be a good idea to pack it with clay. In Choctaw language, clay is called lokfinia, it means the fat of the earth. He took that basket and coated it in clay, and then he set it next to a fire for the clay to dry. And he got up to do something else. Another man came along and he saw that basket with the clay in it and said, well, that basket's dirty. I'm just going to put it in this fire and burn it up, which he did. And when that happened, the heat from the river came burning caused the clay to go through a chemical change and become more like stone. So it produced this container that was not only waterproof, but it could also be heated or cooked in. And that's the advent of top pot potty. Archaeology tells us that that happened around 3,500 years ago. And ever since then, top pot potters have been developing different styles and different technological techniques to make pottery that cooks in the fire, cooks food in the fire, and also a variety of other tasks. So those are some of the basic implements. Another part of the research was to look at seasonality in our traditional diet. And it was possible to, to find that there was an original Choctaw calendar. It was 13 months based on the phases of the moon. The year began with the first full moon after the fall equinox, and it proceeded from there. Many of the Choctaw month names correspond to natural events that are happening in the Choctaw homeland at those particular seasons of the month. And many other month names correspond with Choctaw foods, parts of our traditional diet. In order to be able to reconstruct our traditional foods, they had to be reconstructed in a way that was tied to these months and to the seasons of the year when different things were done. The Choctaw diet we found was really seasonal. You know, it wasn't the same from one month to another. It, it changed. And so I'm going to go through the months in our traditional calendar now and explain some of the food preparation activities that were occurring and show you some of the foods that our ancestors made during a specific month. The first month in the Choctaw calendar, 
is Little Hunger Month. This is basically in October and the calendar that people use today. This was right after the harvest season, so at first it seems kind of strange to have a month called Little Hunger Month when food was abundant. But the reason that it's called Little Hunger Month is that when Choctaw communities were getting ready to go on the fall hunt. So for Choctaws, part of going hunting is a, a spiritual activity. You have to get right spiritually in order to be successful in hunting. And a part of getting right spiritually involves fasting. So hence the name Little Hunger Month because this is the time of year when the community would be fasting for the success of the upcoming hunt. Nevertheless, there were a number of food preparation activities that took place at this time. One of the most important was the acorn and hickory nut harvest. Some Choctaw villages were located near groves of hickory trees and oak trees. Some of them were named after those groves, and it's because of the tremendous source of food that they provided. It was possible in one good year for a family of three in about a month's time to gather enough hickory nuts to provide the calories that they would need for up to three years. Acorns are the most abundant mass crop in the United States. It's a tremendous resource. It's not really utilized very much today, but in the past it certainly was. The image that you see here is the Choctaw one at home during this month. The elder men in the Choctaw village who weren't preparing to go out on the hunt, they build the family's winter homes for when the hunters return in the spring. This is Choctaw acorn bread. It's made from acorns that are carefully processed to leach out the tannic acid, the ground up, and then a paste made out of them, and they put on the end of a stick and cooked almost just like a hot dog. The taste is amazing. They're, they're rich and filling. It's almost like a Russian tea cake minus the sugar. This is oak chash. This is a, a chopped pasty that's made out of red oak acorns. Um, in this case, it, it's mixed with venison, which you see there, which was common. This dish, and uh, you see that it's in a, a wooden wooden tray there. Um, this type of dish probably goes back about six, 7,000 years. That's the time period of the spear point that you see there. That's the time period that archaeological evidence suggests that our ancestors started processing acorns for food a very long time. This is oak taco como. These, these are balls that are made out of hickory nut meat. Um, there are different ways to process them, but this is the simplest way. You just crack open the, the hickory nuts inside the mortar and pestle that I showed you earlier. You pick out the nut fragments, then you grind them up in the mortar and pestle, and then you make these balls to store. When you want to use one of these Oksako Como balls, you drop it into a stew, and it dissolves, and it, it's amazing. It's like adding half a stick of butter to the stew, but the fat balance with the hickory nuts, of course, is much more beneficial than the butter. This is something that a few of our elders still remembered, but nobody's really made it in a while until recently just because of the amount of effort involved. But it, it's truly a remarkable feat. The next month in the Choctaw calendar is Big Hunger Month. There are a lot of stereotypes about Native American communities, and some of these involve our food. Um, even many of our community members see our ancestors as being heavy meat eaters. That's probably because the Plains Indian culture um, gets quite a bit of press, so people think that all Native Americans live on buffalo. But that's not true. Actually, for a Choctaw diet, through most of the year, meat was only a side dish. You know, it wasn't a main course meal. The exception is during big hunger month and during the winter hunt. For these two to three months out of the year, in the hunting camps, meat was the main course dish for Choctaws, but it wasn't during the rest of the year. The most important animal for us for meat was white-tailed deer, followed by the bear, followed by turkey, and some, sometimes in places followed by the bison. The image that you see at the right there, that's a, a deer roast being cooked on a spit over a fire, and that spit is made out of sassafras wood. Our ancestors often experimented with subtle flavors by using different woods in the cooking process, or by just like barbecue folks do today, by using different woods to create smoke to infuse the meat. This image is Choctaw persimmon bread. Uh, at the left there are persimmons that are not ripe. At the right are persimmons that are ripe. If you guys have ever eaten a raw persimmon, it, it's not pleasant at all. Uh, it's got so much tannic acid, it feels like it's turning your mouth inside out. But for those of you who have eaten a ripe persimmon, it's also a memorable experience. It's, it's like eating custard. It's just amazing. 
our ancestors processed persimmon bread by taking really ripe persimmons, and they would push the pulp through the sieve basket that you see here. So the seeds and the skins would stay behind in the basket that the pulp would go through. They'd take that pulp and lay it on a flat board, spread it out thin and dry it in the sun, and it makes something that's very much like fruit leather. That's what you see pictured here. This was a traveling food. Our ancestors would carry that when they were out in the woods going to hunting camps or, or going wherever. It made a good traveling food because it was very lightweight. It was also very high in nutrition and calories. It has medicinal properties as well. So like one of the things about Choctaw traditional food is that yes, they provide nourishment, but they're also medicines, preventative medicines, sometimes medicines for acute conditions as well. And this is one of those. Today our national dish arguably is banaha bread. Banaha bread is a little bit similar idea to the tamales that were made by the Aztec folks in Mexico. Basically you take a, a cornmeal dish and you wrap it up in corn husks so that you can transport it. Choctaw banaha is made from a, a variety of different things that are added to the cornmeal. Sometimes they add hickory nuts, sometimes sweet potatoes, sometimes ash from pea pods, all to change the flavor. To make it to travel, they would mix up that cornmeal and the other ingredients with boiling water. They'd wrap corn husks around it, and then they'd set it by a fire and let it dry so it would get hard. They'd wrap those corn-covered packages, and they'd string those corn-covered packages on a lanyard and carry that with them wherever they were going, and then when they were ready to eat it, they would take some of those banaha packages, put them in boiling water, and be ready to eat high-calorie nutritional dish. This is persimmon stew. This combines ripe persimmons with deer meat, with cornmeal. And it kind of brings together the flavors of the, the fall hunt. Um, definitely nutritious, a little bit of an acquired taste. This is a, a dish called ashila in Choctaw. It combines meat from poultry you know, like turkeys, you take that and you boil it until it starts to starts to fall off the bones, and then you start stirring in cornmeal to thicken it. And you can also put in cooked beans or sunflower seeds. It's also a really sustaining fall type dish. Around Thanksgiving time, the seeds for the lamb's quarter come ripe. This is the plant that I was talking about earlier. Uh, it's a relative of the plant that produces quinoa, and the seeds taste almost just like quinoa grain. So our ancestors would take these and they would roast them in a pot over the fire, and then they would boil them to make a stew. They'd combine that with nuts and possibly beer meat. And this was the national dish, not just the national dish, but if you went to the eastern United States 2,000 years ago, this was the most common dish that you would find. They still continued to be made by our ancestors way up past contact time. So even in the 1700s, the time period that I'm focusing on in my talk, this would still be a dish that would have been eaten. As you move into the heart of the winter, you've got the Choctaw Panther and Wildcat months, you know, December and January. These are named this because at this season, the hunters would shift their focus from deer, and they would move down to the swamps and the cane breaks, and there they would hunt animals that were wintering, um, fur-bearing type animals, like panther and wildcat, and some monk things. This is also the season of the Choctaw bear hunt. Um, bear meat was important, but even more important was the lard from the animal. It was used as a flavoring agent. It was used to fry things. It was used as a drizzle. Very important in Choctaw traditional food. On the left-hand side, that is real bear grease, and it's frying in a Choctaw clay bowl on the fire. On the right-hand side, that's the original Choctaw fry bread. Those are corn pones that are made out of hand ground cornmeal, fried in bear grease, and the flavor is just amazing. This is the American Lotus. Um, you know, I know the Corps of Engineers Mobile District deals with these, possibly blocking navigational channels. For our ancestors, this plant was important. It's called oak palm. It was used in medicine in several different ways. It was also used in food in several different ways. About this season, they would go out in canoes, and the seed heads look almost like shower heads. That's what's that's pictured here. They'd knock off those seed heads, and then inside, the seeds are pretty large size, and they've got a hard shell. They'd crack those open, and inside, it, it tastes almost like an almond. They would take those and grind those up. 
in the bread. This is what they look like. This is the bread that's made out of them. That's a, a traditional way to cook it there. You take wet clay and spread it on the ground, throw the hot fire on top of it to sterilize it, scoop the coals away, put the bread loaf down on the hot clay prepared slab. Then you take a shell tempered cooking bowl and put it over the bread, which is what you see here. And then you pack coals around it, just like a Dutch oven. And in about an hour, you pull it away. And that bread's pretty amazing. It tastes, tastes almost like popcorn on the surface, and it's soft and chewy inside. And then the American lotus seeds provide a sweetness to it. Crane months roughly correspond to February. I always named that because this is the season when migratory birds came through Choctaw Country. The most important among them is the passenger pigeon. At one time, there were more passenger pigeons in the world than there were people. Uh, the flocks would come through. The, the animals, the passenger pigeon, they would be up around the Great Lakes in the summertime, and then they would winter down in Choctaw Country. As the flocks came through for that migration, they, there were so many animals that, they were, that at a speed flying over at 60 miles an hour, it would take four days for the flock to pass. This was a tremendous food resource. Our ancestors hunted them when they were roosting at night. In addition to meat from passenger pigeon and other migratory birds, our ancestors created a lot of dishes at this time of year from the, the roots of the loyal green bar, pictured to the right there that's bread that's made out of it. Windy month is March. This is the season when the last of the hunting parties would start to return to the Choctaw villages. The reason for that is because men and women would work together to get the agricultural fields prepared for planting later that year. This is the time when they started making Choctaw summer houses. That's what you see pictured here. Um, those houses are designed to keep the rain off, but to let the breeze in so they stay relatively cool. This is also the last season for harvesting river cane to make baskets. So you see pictures at the right there with the Choctaw basket from around the time period of the trail of tears, early 1800s. During the season, the first spring green up begins. The first, one of the first edible plants that comes out is wild onions. Our ancestors ate these in the homeland, but they became even more important for Oklahoma Choctaws on the trail of tears. The Choctaw trail of tears immigration parties moved from Mississippi to Oklahoma in the dead of winter because they were trying to avoid cholera and other disease outbreaks in the journey. During that time of year, as I said, the wild onions were one of the first things to green up. So a lot of those immigration parties relied on these to prevent starvation. And Choctaws in Oklahoma has remembered that uh, still today in the springtime. A number of the Choctaw church congregations have wild onion suppers where they invite people to, to come in with the fun for the church. Koshiba, poke, is another really early green that comes right in Choctaw country. Many of you have probably eaten it. Of course, it has to be harvested early in the season. Um, you can pick the leaves when they're, when they're young and yellow green. You can cut the shoots when they're still under six inches and um, a greenish color. The picture that you see to the right here is parboiling the poke leaves. Choctaw folks understood, but like many others, the poke has a lot of nutritional benefits. You know, it was used by us and others as a spring tonic. But every part of the poke plant also has toxins in it. So the parboiling method that you see here is one method of removing those toxins while leaving most of the nutrition, again, to create greens that we need to spend upon it. The warm season uh, begins with the equinox in the spring. First month is Women's Month, which is April. This month was named that because women were recognized as the chief food producers in South Nation. And this is when they planted the first of three gardens that our communities did. These gardens were called house gardens. They were located around the house, and they planted their, their favorite vegetables there. This is also a season when some communities conducted burns. Um, they would burn the landscape, burn the prairies, burn the woods, and they would have a, a crop of forbs and grasses come back. What you see here is a picture of lamb's quarter. Again, this is what it looks like early in the season. As I mentioned earlier, those greens are one of the most nutritious things that you can eat. They compare favorably to raw spinach. These fires help to produce good growth, good crops of seeds like this in the wood. Mulberry month roughly corresponds with May. This is when the two main types of agricultural fields were planted by our community. The reason for that is because 
they waited until there were ripe fruits, ripe wild fruits available in the woods and occurred to distract the animals so that they wouldn't come destroy the young plants and the Choctaw crops. Mulberries, of course, are one of the first ripening fruits in Choctaw country along with strawberries. The way that the fields were prepared is that they were burned over, and you see that in the picture there at the left, the right-hand side that's been burned. Um, if there were trees, they would be girdled the year before so that they would die, and then they'd fall down and they would burn those up with everything else. Burning put nutrients into the soil and created a black cover on the soil that helped it to heat up earlier in the year. And then they would use a digging stick and a mussel shell hoe, which you see in that same picture, to gently till up the top inch or so of soil. You could almost consider this an no-till agriculture. It, it certainly helped to cut down on erosion compared to plowing. The month of June was called Blackberry Month. Uh, blackberries are important in Choctaw traditional foods. They're used in several different ways. One of those is to make, make walakshi, which you see pictured at the right here. That's a type of dumpling made out of cornmeal cooked in blackberry juice. Versions of it are still made today. It's recognized as a wedding dish today. Right around this time, the first, the first corn crop would start to become a uh, I talked to you earlier about the Choctaw house gardens. In those gardens, they planted a quick ripening variety of Choctaw corn. This would be ripe by early June or so. At that time, the community would hold the green corn ceremony. It's called Luwak Mosholi in Choctaw, which literally means fire extinguished. Before they had any new produce from their gardens, they would hold this ceremony to fully cleanse themselves, to thank God for, for the success of the crops and also to forgive everybody for past wrongs that had been committed except murder. And when they got themselves completely cleansed and ready to start a new year, they would partake of the, the crops bounty. And that's a way that they, they maintained connection with the land and with God. Moving into the hotter part of the year, we've got Sassafras month. This month is called that because Choctaws would make Sassafras root tea as a remedy for dealing with the heat. They drink that to help them stay cool. Ultimately, in the future, that got turned into a root beer. The image that you see here is Choctaw women and a girl working in one of the major agricultural fields. As I said earlier, there were two main agricultural fields. One of these were these large crops that combined corn, beans, squash, sunflowers, and edible so-called weeds that would come up between them. These were planted in a way whereby the stock of the corn provided a place for the beans to run up. The squash have these big giant leaves and they provide shade on the ground to keep it from drying out to help limit weeds. The beans provide nitrogen in the soil. So it's a way, it's not, not fully sustainable. You can't garden the same piece of land that way continuously, but it does help it to be more sustainable than just a monocrop. In the background, that's uh, Pony a pony. That's where a Choctaw woman. It was a it was a platform where a Choctaw woman would sit up there and work on basketry or beadwork or something like that while watching to scare the crows away. The season uh, river king was a major food. Today, river king is pretty rare, but in the past, it was extremely common. It was carefully managed by communities for for a variety of uses, including basketry. River king goes to seed depending on the species once every five years to every 40 years. When the stand of king goes to seed, then the entire stand dies. But you can go out and collect vast quantities of seed. This picture shows the results of just one of two times I've ever seen river king and seed. You take the seeds and you husk them, and inside are these beautiful, green, nutritious sunflower-like things. Um, this tastes like sunflower seeds there. These are used in making breads and stew. Each month, or possibly plum month, is corresponding with the hottest part of the year. At this time, Choctaw communities living in the interior of Mississippi and Alabama would lay their crops by. They'd bend the ears of the, the top tassels of the corn down, and they'd let it start to dry. They would go to streams, and they would use different fishing techniques to procure uh, an important food source while also going to a place where they could cool off and enjoy some recreation while the crops continue to get ready for harvest. Some Choctaw settlements were located on the Gulf Coast, and some of those fish and shellfish was far more important than corn. It actually made up the bulk of the diet. 
What you see pictured here is catfish and it's being cooked on a grill. Ideally, the fire would be smaller than what you see here, it'd just be coals. That's called ayabani in the Choctaw language, that apparatus. That same apparatus was called by natives living in the Caribbean, barbacoa. That's actually where the English word barbecue comes from. It's from this native cooking apparatus that was used for fish and other things. This is a close-up of the catfish cooking on it, and you can see the grill is made out of river cane. If you're going to be smoking the catfish, the river cane helps you gauge the temperature. When the cane starts to sweat, you know that it's getting too hot. This is the finished dried catfish. Smoke is pretty amazing tasting. Uh, it will last for at least three days before it starts to go bad. This is a really cool way, one of my favorite ways for cooking fish. Uh, you take the fish and clean it. If you want to, you can put some sassafras leaf crumbles on it, and then you wrap it up in corn husks, coat that in clay from right there in the stream bank, and then you take those packages of coated clay and just throw them in the coals of the fire and leave them until they start to crack. When you open it up, you've got these perfectly cooked fish. This way to cook is pretty clever to me because it doesn't require anything other than a knife. You don't have to have a pot or a pan or grease or anything like that. And it makes something that's really tasty. In the Choctaw, Choctaw calendar, the big food month was called cooking month. That was September. This is right as the new agricultural harvest was coming in. But the reason that it was called cooking month wasn't directly because of the harvest. It's because they were cooking up all of the foods that had been stored over from last year to make room for the new ones. This was a, definitely a time of feasting. And things like you see here, this is the inside of the Choctaw Winter House from this time period with the new crops in it. The harvest was done by the whole community working together, from the most powerful leader down to the poorest person. Everybody worked together as equals to harvest the crops. People would get a portion of the crop to use on their own, and then they would donate to community larders. And those larders would be used to help families in need if their house burned down. Uh, if they ran out of food, visitors to the community, that type of thing, it was a way to ensure that nobody went hungry. This is a variety of Choctaw beans. These are all the seeds that are left. When you think about the fact that these seeds were carefully selected over 800 years, one season to the next, by Choctaw farmers, the value of these few grams becomes just inestimable to us. You know, those things are worth more than gold to us because 800 years of work went into them. This is chopped off sweet potato squash. It looks like a pumpkin. Uh, it's extremely sweet flavored. Our ancestors carefully cultivated this and selected seeds so that it would store well. You can take one of these and just set it on the shelf in your kitchen and it will last for about a year. Corn was a big part of the diet of most Choctaw communities in 1700. I'm going to show you a few of the ways that it was prepared. This is parching it. Uh, you put the corn in a clay bowl with hot coals and stir it in the fire. This dries it out, gives it a different flavor. A lot of our dishes with corn were fermented. Uh, fermentation was sometimes preceded by mixing the corn with wood ash and lime. The wood ash um, neutralized toxins from corn mold. It added a different flavor to the corn. It made certain nutrients more available. And as I said, sometimes that wood ash treated corn was allowed to ferment to change the flavor of the dish. Basically, this dish would transition over a period of several days. It was designed to, to be safe and to be edible and to be tasty over a period of time without refrigeration in the warm, humid southeast. This is a dish that combines corn, beans, and squash um, together. They're grown together in the garden, as I said. When they're eaten together, they're more healthy. This is a different version of Wallachsi, the corn dumplings. This one's made with muscadines. Cooked Choctaw sweet potato squash. This is what the squash looks like when it's preserved for winter. It's cut into slices that look like donuts, and those are dried out over a smoky fire. The flavor is amazing because the squash is already sweet, and it gets that smoky flavor. Um, you break those up and put them into stew, and just add a whole other dimension to it. Our diet traditionally did not have a lot of salt in it. Instead, what they used for that spice was called hitok. You take the the pea pods and the bean pods when they're dry and you burn them into ash and you use that. There's still a couple of elders I know today that use this spice rather than salt as a way to fight high blood pressure. So that's a, a year through the Choctaw traditional calendar of food. 
And to recap, in the spring, the diet was based on shoots, which are high in vitamins and minerals. This is what people's bodies needed to recover from the wintertime. In the summer, the diet was dominated by fruits and fresh produce. These are high in energy as people were going out to play stickball. This was also the main time when raiding parties threatened Choctaw villages, so people needed to be in peak physical condition. During the fall, the diet was focused on nuts and animal protein. These helped people to, people's bodies to prepare for winter. In the winter, the diet was focused on stored foods and also tubers, which have a lot of starch, and that starch helped people to sustain through the winter, but it wasn't eaten year-round, just, just that season, which helped people to be healthy. Overall, the diet was based on plant foods predominantly. It was supplemented with meat. When our ancestors ate, ate animal products, actually their choice cuts were usually the organ meats rather than the muscle meats. They have a lot more nutrition in them. Additionally, seafood was important, especially for the Choctaw communities on the coast. And again, the diet was low sodium. So I'm about at the end of my presentation time here. Uh, I would like to have a few moments for questions, but just very shortly to summarize, the Choctaw traditional diet, particularly as it pertains to the diet that our community eats today, the traditional diet focused on purity. It was making sure that the different food ingredients came from clean sources. It was making sure that uh, if something was considered unclean, like an unclean animal, it was not eaten. Uh, it was also about making sure that food production happened in a way that was connected with God spiritually. Diversity, our diet relied on dozens and dozens of different plant foods. It relied on, if you look at some of the old Choctaw archaeological sites, they may have two dozen animal species bones represented in the storage pits. So the diet was highly diverse. Um, it wasn't standardized across families. Different families had different strains of seeds. They farmed in just a little bit different way. If the agricultural crops failed, then there were wild plant foods. So what this did was it created a tremendous amount of resiliency. While the Choctaw community was going through colonization, as I explained, 90% of the folks died from European disease. Even during that, we were still able to export food to the Chickasaw and to European colonies. And if that happened to most modern modern communities, that they, they wouldn't be able to feed themselves. But the diet was so diverse and so stable, that we not only fed ourselves, but managed to export it. Choctaw diet considers the whole. Um, this is like the corn, beans, and squash that I was telling you about, but on a bigger scale. So not only were those three plants planted in the gardens, but then the gardens were rotated, and then not just the gardens were rotated, but the whole settlements were rotated on a period of centuries. That helped to preserve the topsoil, and it made it such that even after 12,000 years of occupation, the soils of the Choctaw homeland were not degraded when Europeans adapted. It was a fully sustainable food system. The last element of top top traditional food is respect. And, you know, this, I don't have a lot of time to go into it, but this refers to, in a lot of ways, not taking more than is needed. So when French colonists first came into Choctaw country, they called Choctaw the easy because with our food way, people could work only for about four hours a day and have all that they needed to eat so they could spend the rest of the time socializing or playing sports or whatever. When the French encountered Choctaws, we we're not particularly eager to go to war against the other Native communities around us. You know, they saw that as cowardice, but we saw it as respecting their rights and, again, conserving the land. Anthropology, until quite recently, saw a top talk society as a failure to attain a state-level society because we did not grow continuously. So really, when you look at that and the other things I've mentioned and some other things that there's not time to mention, all of these things set our society up to be sustainable and self-reliant in the homeland, which it was for a very long time. That knowledge, when it's revitalized, has the opportunity to raise quality of life for our community today, and particularly when it comes to food, because our community has so many diet-related challenges. So the information that I've presented here today is just a tiny fraction of what's been learned over the last few years and our specific programs to understand the pre-contact Choctaw Foodway. This information is disseminated through a variety of ways. One of these is the Choctaw Food Book, the 400-page book that I put together that includes the other 99% of what I wasn't able to include in this presentation today. The tribe has a Growing Hope program where we protect and preserve the seeds of Choctaw cultivars that have been passed down for generations from the homeland. 
Then we distribute these seeds. When, once we have enough of them that they're not going to go extinct, we distribute these seeds to the community, along with information about how to grow them, along with information about how to produce traditional foods from them that can help fight diabetes and obesity and all of that. Um, this research is connected with a project my wife and I have done called the Namalaya Farmstead. Um, we set up a small family farm focusing on bison right now and using sustainable agriculture and traditional concepts to produce healthy food while supporting the community. Information is shared through tribal programs like Yopoli. It's a program that works with Choctaw women and it focuses it on traditional culture and traditional food to help empower them and ultimately their families towards healthier, higher quality of life. And then the Choctaw Nation, as I said, is a large tribe. We have a number of tribal members, some of whom are trained chefs. So these folks are working to take what's being learned about our traditional foods and incorporate it into a modern, fine food sort of setting. This includes two restaurants that are run by the Choctaw Nation, as well as other restaurants that are run by tribal members independently. Ultimately, this information is something that belongs to the next generation, so it's being passed along in a variety of culture camps. And these folks right here, the ones that are going to take this information and use it in a way that can benefit our community to the fullest. With that, I'll end my presentation. Um, thank you for staying. It's like a lot of people did. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat. Okay, we've got a question. Was there any fish considered unclean to eat? And my answer to that is, is no, I've never heard of that. If you look at the archeological deposits, the shell midden, and also some of the, the storage pits and trash pits for Choctaw sites along the Gulf Coast, they're filled with dozens and dozens of different species. As far as I'm aware, there, there weren't any fish species that were considered unclean to eat. The species that were considered unclean were mostly things that were brought in through the colonial process. Hogs, for example, were. Chickens were, too. For years, decades after those animals were brought in, Choctaws would raise them but not eat them. They would raise them and export them to the French colonies for trade goods. Even up much later after Choctaws did start to eat those things, when a woman was expecting a child, she wouldn't eat them, and even her husband wouldn't for fear that they would damage the, the child. Are there any traditional recipe books that you would recommend? Not not to plug what I've been doing, but I would recommend the Choctaw food book that I showed a picture of earlier. It's got recipes for 90 purely indigenous Choctaw foods. They came from the historical sources that I mentioned, and they include no ingredients from European sources at all. It's just purely Choctaw. The cookbook goes through and it talks about how to cook each one in clay pottery on a wood fire, and it also talks about how to adapt each one to a modern kitchen. The food book, after I completed it, I donated it to Choctaw Nation, and the tribe sells it at the Choctaw store online. Are there any camps that outsiders can attend? Um, not camps, per se, but there are certainly places where outsiders can come and interact with Choctaw traditional foods. Uh, the main one that comes to mind is the Choctaw Nation Labor Day Festival. It's held, obviously, over the Labor Day weekend at the Tushkahoma Capitol site in the central part of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Um, if you come there, there's a living village and all kinds of different activities going on, many of which involve food that, that anybody can participate in. Uh, question, for a while you were able to get some of the original foods from a few kitchens in the nation. Do you know where I can pick up some of the food? You know, most of these foods are things that you can grow yourself or go out into the woods and collect. That's, that's part of the beauty of it. If you want real indigenous Choctaw food, there, there aren't any restaurants right now that serve it, not like from the traditional crops that I've talked about. You know, it's been adapted to what's available today. However, we do have a cultural center that is opening 
slated for March right now, depending on what happens with the virus. And a part of that will be a kitchen, and that kitchen will be serving components of indigenous Choctaw food. So that will be the first place I know of that you could get it by, by purchasing it instead of producing it yourself. All right, I'm looking back to these comments. Any, any other questions? Was food prepared for individual families or more at the community level? Usually what happened is our settlements were set up in such a way that houses would be arranged where there would be a matriarch, you know, a grandmother, and then her daughter's houses would be nearby, and they were all obviously related. So when it came time to cook, one house would take the responsibility for a week, and then the next house would, and the next house would, so that people didn't have to cook every day. As I mentioned, some of the dishes were intentionally made so that they could be eaten repeatedly over a period of time, and they would actually change over time by fermenting so that the flavors changed, but they were still healthy and they were still nutritious. Feasting was definitely important, too. Um, when, when feasts happened, that's when food tended to be more diverse because there would be more families bringing different things. A lot of times those feasts took place at earth mounds, but there, there were all different reasons for it. Uh, we just passed. The Halloween season, our community had something like that back in the 1700s and before. It was called the Feast of the Dead. It was almost like Memorial Day. You know, the first part of the event was honoring the folks that had died during the previous year in the community and, you know, taking care of the remains respectfully. And then the community would return to the village of the living and have a feast there. So these feasts were incorporated into a lot of different things through the years. Where will that new center be? It will be in Durant, Oklahoma. Looking back to the comments to see if I missed any questions. Am I aware of where the largest Choctaw populations are currently living? Within the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, I think we have about 40,000 tribal members that actually live within our 10 and a half counties. Within the state of Oklahoma, I believe there are an additional 50,000 that live outside the boundaries of Choctaw Nation, but within the state of Oklahoma. There are about 40,000 Choctaw Nation tribal members who live in the state of California. Um, their, their grandparents were, were moved out there um, for urban Indian relocation, or possibly they went out there to seek economic opportunity during the Great Depression. The Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians lives in our homeland. They're headquartered at Philadelphia, Mississippi. They have about 10,000 tribal members. Um, those folks are, are cultural. They speak our language. They do a lot of our traditional foods. The Gina Band of Choctaw Indians is located in central Louisiana. And they have about 250 tribal members. There are other unrecognized Choctaw groups living in Louisiana, some of whom have a lot of Choctaw culture and knowledge. And then because of urban Indian relocation, there are Choctaw folks living in every major urban center around the United States. Our office and our department does cultural outreach to them. So when COVID is not going on, we travel to all the major cities around the United States. And you know, oftentimes there'll be hundreds of Choctaw people that come for the events. Still looking through these comments. All right, I think that is the end of the questions. Thank you guys very much. And again, Choctaw Nation respects the Corps of Engineers and our government to government relationship. Appreciate the opportunity to share part of our culture with you. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.